This is going to be the first of two sessions that I'm holding here this week at ITP. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the session first. Um, so today, this session is basically going to be more of a theoretical and mathematical um, or broadly a broad overview of the theory and math behind some of the trends that we see in recent uh, machine learning and deep learning research. And then um, the second session, which is on Saturday, which I suppose lots of you have probably signed up for both, um, is going to be more applied, and I'm going to take you kind of on a tour of some of the materials that I've been building on this website called ml4a.github.io, which I'll be referencing a lot um, throughout today. Um, so l I think last time I checked, there was something like 75 people RSVP'd for both of the sessions, which is amazing. I'm like really thrilled by that. I don't even think this room could hold that many people. Um, but for, for me, that's really especially, um, that's especially awesome because um, this, these materials are actually very closely tied to this school. I taught a class here last year called Machine Learning for Artists, and the last time I was here was actually for ITP Camp um, last year, so maybe some of you were here for that. And, um, and this year I decided to have two sessions instead of one and kind of try to focus the first one on basically just a more or less straight up lecture on theory and, and math because um, I've been doing a lot of workshops because uh, I've been doing a lot of workshops and usually there's a, especially in, in, in places like this where there's a lot of like people wanting to hack right away, we kind of like blow through the theory um, of which there's a lot to kind of uh, cover. And um, of course there's like pros and cons to that. We get, we get our hands very, very quickly, but then sometimes there's a, some insights that are to be gained when you kind of go a little bit further with, with, uh, with the theory that underlies it. And it helps to, to uh, maybe devote some time into looking into those things more closely so as to not maybe um, lock yourself into the typical use cases that come with the software that you're kind of using. Um, and so this should be kind of hopefully fun. I'll be showing you a lot of like really um, bizarre and very new kinds of um, visual art that have been created using machine learning. And so, and a lot of it is like really cutting edge. So and in fact, a lot of it is stuff that uh, is new since the last time I was here last year. Um, so that should be, um, that should be kind of, um, should be exciting for us. I also want to mention really quickly, I'm recording the session. So I have, you see, I have a microphone here and um, should be putting it online later. That's just because, um, so for those who couldn't make it, I'd like to try to make my materials available. And um, we'll keep things hopefully as interactive as possible. We do have like a relatively large group, so maybe it will be hard to do, to do that through until the end. Um, but in any case, like if you ask a question or something and you don't want to be in the recording, um, I'm not reco I'm only recording my screen. Like there's no cameras on you guys that I'm aware of anyway. Um, but um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, like if you don't want to be on it, just let me know and we'll make sure it doesn't happen. Um, okay. So the main uh, impetus for this session is to talk about these things, um, generative models. And um, if you have been uh, if you've been keeping up with this field over the last year or two, you've probably you might be familiar with some of these kinds of graphics. And all of them, except for these right here, are examples of generative models, which I'm going to define um, really um, in just a moment. Um, and I'm going to attempt to do it in in kind of the most um, like in a, in a high level sort of in a high level way, right? Which is to say that I don't want to show too many equations. I want to kind of uh, you know use use visuals whenever I whenever I can uh, in order to tra uh, like transmit these kind of um, uh, these concepts, right? Because um, I think, you know, for me, like when I, when I think about, we're going to talk about principal component analysis in a second, but whenever I, uh, when I first learned PCA, I was super confused by it because all I got to look at were equations. But it actually, if you look at it geometrically, it makes total sense and you'll see why in just a moment. So what are generative models? Um, so a generative model is basically any model which is able to randomly create a, uh, and, and is, is a, a generative model is any model which is able to create a random sample of data given some data distribution, right? And they're kind of coupled with, um, or they, you might say they're, they're complementary to discriminative models, which if you have followed machine learning, you're probably more familiar with. So discriminative models are um, classification and regression and more or less any kind of uh, machine learning algorithm whose job is to kind of tell you what something is or, or you know, how much a stock price is going to rise or how much it's going to rain tomorrow and so on. 
And generative models, what they do is essentially they, they learn the prob probability distribution over a set of data. And they're quite interesting for many reasons. Um, of course, they, they're interesting for a lot of analytical purposes. They do a lot of the same things that discriminative models can do. Um, but they also are able to, well, once you've learned a probability distribution over your data, you can sample from it. You can sample points that didn't actually appear in the data. And that's kind of like a hint of, what, of things to come that we'll see. Um, and of course, like if you're, you know, if you're using processing, P5.js, or open frameworks, you're, you're probably interested a lot in generative art. And um, uh, generative models are in many ways very similar, of course, to, to the stuff that you're already familiar with. It's going to be, we're going to be creating things that are kind of uh, the, end, the end result of some algorithmic process. But in the case of generative models learned from machine learning, they're going to be reflecting the real world to us rather than just some, like, um, some algorithms that we kind of came up with in our heads. Um, so let's kind of take a moment to appreciate why this is so difficult um, to do to, to, create sam to create images that are, that are generative. Um, and we're going to be doing, we're going to be mostly sticking to the visual domain, a lot of images, but a lot of this uh, is very broadly applicable to text and to sound and lots of other kinds of media. So um, with visuals, of course, it's much easier for us to see. And so that's why it's kind of the best way to introduce the topic. But just keep in mind that this, this stuff is actually much more general than it may seem. So um, let's do like a little quick thought experiment, right? So suppose we have a 32 by 32 pixel image right here. And we're generating just random, we're just randomizing all the pixels every, let's say like a billion times per second, just really, really fast. Um, you might ask a question like, um, how long will it take before this image accidentally produces this right here, which is the face of the Mona Lisa, right? Um, well, it turns out that you'll be basically waiting for that to happen until, until the end of time, because it'll basically never happen. And the reason why um, we can appreciate if we consider the numbers, right? So there's, there's 32 by 32 pixels, which means that we have um, 1,024 pixels in total. And every pixel is a R R G has an RGB color value, which means that there are this many possible, uh, possible values that that pixel can um, can have, or, or roughly 16 million, right? So this is 16 million bit color. Um, so that means that there are this many possible images that we can make, make out of 1,024 pixels. That's 16 million raised to the 1,024th power. And as you can see, like there's no no computer is ever going to be able to give you an estimate of that because it's just a it's an incomprehensibly large number. And we can compare that number to a few other numbers, right? So the number of grains of sand on Earth is estimated to be something like 10 to the 19th or 10 to the 20th. The, uh, I love this, the Planck time since the Big Bang. You guys know what a Planck time is? It's the amount of time it takes for a beam of light to cross a Planck length, which is the smallest possible unit of me measurement you can, you can have, um, which is something, it's like, a, it's like a level of quarks or something. I'm not a physicist, so I don't know exactly. But this is the number of, this is the Planck time since the Big Bang. Atoms in the universe, 10 to the 80th, right? So there's a lot of atoms in the universe. Uh, and then, but then, you know, none of these can even compare to things that we as humans have been able to come up, you know, like combinatorial processes. So the number of possible chess positions that you can have is 10 raised to the 120th. So that's 40 orders of magnitude more than the number of atoms in the universe. The number of Go boards, for anyone who's interested in Go, um, that's, that's yet another 50 orders of magnitude. So 10 to the 170th. The number of possible images that we can make is this number, roughly, like very roughly. It's 10 to the like the 8,000th. So that's a that's an 8,000 digit long number, um, which is you know something that we can't possibly even comprehend how big that is. So um, this is basically uh, we're not if we devote all of the computational resources on Earth to this task, it'll still never even come close to happening, right? And this is kind of called the curse of dimensionality, or it's roughly related to this concept of the curse of dimensionality, which is to say that the more dimensions your data has, the, uh, it, it, the, more p the, the number of possibilities explodes to basically infinity, right? Or practically speaking, infinity. So for us to generate images that are you know, perceptually sort of meaningful, um, there might be a chair somewhere around here. I think you can, no? Okay, yeah, no, no problem. Um, so the, the number of possible images that you can generate is so large, how can we make images that are meaningful to us, right? 
And um, the key, uh, the, the sort of key observation we can make to begin to make this task more, uh, more approachable is to observe that in, in data is not usually, like a data set is not usually uniform or ever basically, uniformly distributed throughout the space of possibilities. It actually, it tends to be that different aspect, different, um, different numbers in your data set are actually highly correlated to each other. So like I'll give you a really small example. Suppose this is a data set where every point represents a house. And on one axis we are, um, on, on one axis we are um, plotting, the, let's say, the size of the house. And the other axis is the cost of the price of the house, right? Well, it's, we, we know intuitively that bigger houses are more expensive and vice versa, right? So those two things are kind of related to each other and they, they might have a positive correlation, right? So somebody observed maybe 100 years ago that you can do a trick to make this space of possibilities to kind of reduce it, to compress it down to something which is, um, which is not so vast as the, as the space that we were just looking at in the previous slide. And what they reasoned was that they said, well, let's say if we found two perpendicular vectors here, which where one of them is spanning the most, the, the, the um, dimension along this data, which has the most variance, right? So this vector kind of goes through this data set and has the most variance internally. Uh, and then the other one has this, the, sec the second vector right here has so somewhat less variance, right? But um, the main thing is this one right here we can take this data and then kind of like rotate it around until this vector becomes just like an axis, like a new axis. And we can take all these points and we can kind of, I don't have a visual for this, but just imagine, use your imagination. We can take all these points and we can like flatten them down so that they all lie along this line, right? So we can project all these points down until all of the points lie along a single line. And then we have a new representation of the data where we don't have two numbers describing it, but we have one number describing it instead. And it hasn't changed that much. Like the points are still kind of in the same order and they have the same, roughly the same distance from each other. And so we haven't lost that much information, but we've compressed it, right? So this is the, um, the observation behind uh, a technique in math, about a hundred year old technique called principal component analysis or PCA for short. Um, so how many people here are familiar with PCA or have maybe like studied it in statistics a little bit? Okay. Um, PCA is, is actually the, the simplest, well maybe not the simplest, but the, but the simplest effective possible generative model that we can come up with. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of build, up, build it up to that. Um, PCA is not primarily used for that reason. It's not primarily actually used as a generative model. Um, it, it has and many other uses, uses that are um, sort of that it's much more suited for, but it actually can uh, be a generative model, and you'll see and you'll see why in just a moment. So let's let's kind of um, think of this what we just did in the last slide. Let's think of it now in three dimensions instead of two. So suppose you now have a d data set in three dimensions. We have an x, y, and z here, and we have a bunch of points. Um, don't worry about like that they're all labeled, you know, pluses and circles and X's. Just consider them all as separate points. Um, so suppose they all lie in this space, but really we look at them and we see that all of them actually, actually happen to lie very close to a plane that cuts through that space. So doing the same process, we can find, we can sort of find that plane and then project all the, all of the data onto the plane and then we have this new representation of the data. So we've kind of taken out this plane and we're representing all this, those points with two, uh, two numbers, an X and a Y, rather than three, right? Um, so this is also now, we, we've done the same thing that we just looked at in the previous slide, except we've done it from 3D to 2D. And actually, uh, there's no reason why you can't go directly from 3D to 1D. So suppose all of these points uh, actually lied very close to a line, a single line, then you could project all those points onto the line and go directly from 3D to 1D. And in doing so, um, you're, you're, um, you're, do, you're accomplishing a few things. Of course, you're reducing the dimensionality of your data set, which is valuable for the reasons we said before, because now we have sort of fewer combinations in our space to, to possibly deal with. Um, but also we're cutting out a lot of empty space. You know, So all of these points lie along this plane which is to say that there are very few points. They're very sparsely observed out here and out here and, and everywhere else. And we're getting rid of all that empty space. 
and we're reducing our representation of those points to something which is actually much more densely, um, densely packed with observed points, um, which should imply something about this, this plane. It should imply that it's kind of like the, the representative of the area which most of our samples lie. Uh, and that's, that's important, right? And we'll see in just a moment. So now, now let's go uh, and think about this for the case of images, okay? So we, we were dealing with 1,024 pixel images. So you can imagine that any image is a point inside of a 1,024 dimensional space, okay? So if, that doesn't, if you're not used to thinking about points in uh, multi-dimensional space, uh, let me try to give you a few, a few insights. So first imagine we have an image with just three pixels, right? Then we have three dimensions. Here's pixel one, pixel two, pixel three. And any possible image is simply some point in this 3D space, right? Now, if we have a 1,024 dimensional image, we have 1,024 axes. And so I can't, I can't actually draw it for you guys anymore. We, we don't have the capacity to imagine this many dimensions. But it turns out, mathematically speaking, that everything works exactly the same in very high dimensional space as it does in 3D dimensional space. And I like to kind of use this quote from Jeffrey Hinton, who's, um, who's one of the sort of pioneers of deep learning. Um, he says, to deal with hyperplanes in, in the high dimensional space, just uh, imagine, imagine three dimensions and just say, you know, 14 very loudly. Just say 14. Um, everybody does it, basically. And that's okay because almost every property of math in, ge in geometric space is preserved um, through in, in, in any amount of dimensions. So this is going to, so what we just observed with principal component analysis can be performed in a high dimensional space. And it's actually much more valuable in that case. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, a, uh, an example of this. And we're gonna, we're gonna show what happens when we apply principal component analysis to a data set of faces. This is a data set that you can find called labeled faces in the wild. Um, this is a data set of like something like 13,000 celebrity faces. You might recognize some of them. I see Jim Carrey in there. Um, I think there's like, there's like many pictures of George W. Bush um, who, <laughs> and you know, lots of other people. And um, so we, we have this data set and, and here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this data set and we're gonna represent it as a, as a matrix where the rows that we have is all of the images of the faces and the columns are the pixels, right? So you have three columns per, for every pixel, a red, green, and a blue. And so if the, if the images are, let's say 100 by 100 pixels, then you have 100 times 100 times three, that's 30,000. We have 30,000 numbers describing this image. So it's a point in a 30,000 dimensional space. So 30,000 dimensions, right? Um, well, it turns out, of course, as you can imagine, that pixels uh, in a data set of faces are incredibly correlated with each other, very highly correlated with each other. Neighboring pixels tend to have similar color values. And of course, with, when, you deal, when you're dealing with uh, a data set which is constrained to one category of images like faces, then you know that it's going to be even, you know, it's going to be correlated in, in more sort of high dimensional ways as well. And so um, we know there's a lot of redundancy in this data. And we know that the, the images of these faces, our data set of 13,000 faces, is not like evenly distributed throughout this 30,000 dimensional space, right? They're actually going to lie on some, what we sometimes call a manifold or like a subspace um, of this 30,000 dimensional space. And with principal component analysis, we, we might try to find it. And um, I'm going to kind of stick to, I'm gonna like, describe how principal component analysis is actually done. Not really, uh, we're not gonna actually look at any matrices because of course like that's not really the, the point, but, uh, but actually it turns out to be relatively straightforward. So you have this data set which we call X, and what happens to X is that when we, we find this matrix W, which is a, a matrix which we multiply by X and it projects our 30,000 dimensional space into a um, into a space where where we've found um, all of these all of these vectors that we saw in the last slide here, right? Basically, these what are called the principal components, and the matrix is sort of ordered by um, the the order of the columns of that matrix is the length of these principal components. So you the first few are going to be very long, 
And then um, as you get towards the tail end of it, the, the, those principal components are going to be very, very small, um, which is to say that they're, they're axes of the data which have very little variation in them, which, is, which means that we can basically get rid of them. So what we do with this matrix is that we just chop off all the columns that, that, are, that have um, very little variance. And we project, um, and one, we've projected our uh, our data set into this smaller space, which we can, you know, which has L dimensions, let's say. Now, um, uh, for anyone who cares, this is done like using a singular value decomposition. If you've ever taken like a linear algebra course, you might be familiar with some of these like matrix factorizations, right? Um, but in any case, like it's just think of it as a as it's just like it with algebra, except with many numbers, right? You have this matrix, you're projecting. You're projecting the original data into a smaller space, and we still we keep we keep W, and that's important. And the reason why that's important is because the process can be uh, can be inverted, can be reversed. So if we simply just move, you know how like in algebra you can you can move a, a multiplier to the other side by multiplying by its reciprocal. It's basically the same thing in with linear algebra. We can move this multiplier to the other side and take this space and reconstruct the data by, by taking our, our, um, the projected uh, points. We can call them codes or something, like codes for the images, and we can project them back out into pixel space, right? which, is, um, which of course uh, has 30,000 dimensions. Right? But here's the thing. Um, once we've gotten rid of the, uh, some, of the, some of the principal components, we have projected the data into this smaller subspace, and which means we've corrupted the data. We've lost some of the information with it, right? Well, that's what happened over here as well, right? We, we projected the data, we flattened it down, so we changed the shape of the data. We can, we can then, once we have all the points in, along this line, we can rotate it back, but then all the points will still be along this line. In other words, we've corrupted the data. We've lost some, in, some information. So um, if we do this with images, we can invert the process and get back to the, uh, in the, the original space, but we will have lost, um, we will have corrupted the images and they, they, will, they won't look exactly like they did before, right? Um, so let's, let's take a look at what happens. Like if we take a random picture, a very random picture <laughs> um, of George W. Bush from, from our labeled faces in the wild data set. Don't you guys miss him so much? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is what happens if you do a PCA in this data set. And then you, you hold either 2,000, 1,500, 150, 10, 2, or 1 of the principal components, and then reproject it back. And so you see the fewer components that you keep, the more corrupted the image becomes, the, the more of the information that is lost, um, until you have basically like just this bland looking sort of, you know, face, right? And um, this right here is 2,000 components, so that means we've compressed it from 30,000 to 2,000, and we, so that's, that's a huge reduction in the amount of data, of course, 30,000 to 2,000, and we've kept most of this structure in the data set. But as we drop more and more of the components, we are corrupting, we're corrupting the image more and more, and the PCA is forced to, um, is, to, is forced to kind of like, what it wants to do is it wants to hold the most important sort of salient characteristics of these faces in its, in, um, in as few columns as possible. That's kind of its goal. And so uh, we're, we, we're basically getting rid of nuance as we drop this down into more and more dimensions. And, um, it's, and it's, it's kind of crazy if you think about it. Like over here, let's say this is two and one principal component. Um, th this means that we're representing this face as just two numbers. We have a code which has two numbers and then we can just multiply it by, this, by these uh, vectors that we derived in the PCA and reconstruct something that looks kind of coherently like a face, like it's kind of blurred. Here it's just one number. So this is, so that, that's a huge reduction in the amount of data and what, what the network is, it, the network is sort of f forced, I, I shouldn't say network because it's not a, a neural network yet, um, the PCA is forced to uh, constrain all of its information into one single number, right? So that's kind of, uh, which means that that, that axis um, along which we projected all of our points onto must be very, very densely sampled and with things that look like faces, basically, right? Um, so like we can do this to a few more samples. 
And one thing that you might observe is that, you know, like it has, as it, as it gets rid of all of the nuance with each of these samples, it converges upon the, the, like the sort of average, like, like the average face in this data set, like what the data thinks is like the essence of a human being, which is kind of this like short haired white male with, with a suit and tie on. Right. So, and that's, that's interesting, right? Like if you, you know, there's a lot of tasks in machine learning. One thing, one that I'm thinking of immediately that comes to mind, anomaly detection, right? With things like credit card fraud and things like that, right? So, so that should maybe like something to think about, um, but, um, but, and take that as you will, right? Um, but yeah, so everyone basically, all roads lead to George W. Bush, basically. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's actually, I think it's like a lot of um, politicians and, and stuff are in it. I said there's like a huge number of George W. Bush photos. And, <laughs> um, and um, okay, so, so let's, let's, um, let's play with this, um, this code a little bit, right? So suppose we, ta we sample two, um, so here I've kept maybe, let's say like a thousand, I don't remember how many, there's maybe 1,000 or 500 of the components have been kept. And we can pick two faces and grab their codes and then interpolate between them. So like pick codes that lie along a straight line between one code to the other and project each one back out into pixel space. And in doing so, we basically create, we, we sort of morph the, the, the reconstructed face into another person's face, right? So these are all actual reconstructions of images in the data set, except all the ones that are in between are not, they don't actually appear in the data set. They're just, they're just interpolations in between. So that's one of the cool things we can do once we have this kind of representation of the space, right? If you try to interpolate from the, in the original pixel space where you just have the images, you would be doing what? You'd just be crossfading, right? It would be like, you know, simplest thing in the world, just, you know, just averaging two images together. But here, because you force the network to represent all of the information as a sort of set of, uh, of feature vectors, which represent some, some salient characteristic of the image, you're doing something that's a little bit more sophisticated than that. You're actually like melting features into each other, which is kind of a new thing, which is kind of a neat thing. Now things get really interesting. So what if you just picked random numbers? Like what if you, what if you reduce this, you have this, um, so we've done the PCA, and so we have this vector, you, we have this set of principal components, W in L dimensions, let's say that's 500 dimensions. What if you just threw in a random vector into it, like a random vector sampled from a normal distribution or something like that? Um, well, what's going to happen is it's going to, of course, like all of the others, it's going to produce something that looks kind of like a face. So that's, that should be really interesting, right? So these are all, all of these samples, these, all of these images, they're actually, uh, they're totally uh, hallucinated. They're like not real people. Right? We have taken a data set of, so, so let's just kind of back up and, and, and summarize what we just did. We took a data set of faces, celebrity faces. We found this set of principal components which characterize the high level features of this uh, data set such that, when once, such, such that we can actually sample uh, new data points from it which appear to, to look like things that came from the original data set but are not actually in it. Right, so that's kind of that is basically what a generative model gives us. It gives us a way of, um, you know, hallucinating unobserved data, which appears as though it could have it would it would have a high probability of occurring in the actual data set that we did the PCA on. So that's what is going on here, and of course we can continue to do those in interpolations. Right, so this is what happens when you just pick random codes and interpolate between them, and so you get sort of like you know, cur just sort of navigating through this generative space of, um, you know, I don't know, um, of faces. And for, for anyone who's interested, like I'll be, I'll be talking more about ML4A later, but there's, a, I have a, a Python notebook, which you can, which you can step through in order to, to reconstruct exactly all of this that you've, that we've just looked at. So that's something that if you, if you feel like you can go through. Okay. So let's move on. Um, so that's PCA. Now PCA is not actually uh, often used as a generative model. In fact, it's almost never used as one. And the reason for that is that it's not, not actually very good at it. Uh, PCA is what we call a linear technique. 
it projects all of our data onto basically high dimensional uh, high dimensional hyperplanes. So they're flat, right? So they're they're analogous to planes. So like if we do if we do PCA in 3D as we saw before, you can't actually like suppose the data was curved. Suppose the data kind of fit a bowl shape. With PCA, you can't make a a bowl shape to kind of project it onto. You can only make a plane. And that's true in many dimensions too. You can only make what's analogous to a plane in, in many dimensions you would call a hyperplane. So it's basically a linear structure, a linear subspace of that, of that space. And because PCA is linear, it's a bit limited. It doesn't necessarily conform to data which is more intricate, you know, maybe, maybe not arranged in a, li in a linear way. And really what we know is that in, in the real world, data tends not to be linearly arranged. It kind of can fit, it can be curved or kind of more erratic, or maybe it's, maybe it's like elliptical. Uh, basically, data tends to be distributed in highly nonlinear ways. And so PCA is, because it's a linear method, it can't, uh, it can't actually fit that kind of data very well. And that's why all of these faces are like really blurry. It can't capture all the nuances, um, even if you keep a lot of, uh, even if you keep uh, a, a really large number of principal components, let alone just a few. Uh, but what can capture uh, nonlinear distributions of data is something called an autoencoder, which is a type of neural network. And I'm going to describe what an autoencoder is in just a few slides, but first I'm going to back up and tell you about neural networks because, um, oh, yes? This one? I, I'm, I'm not sure what you, what do you mean recursive model? Uh, let's get to that part of the <laughs> um, like PCA, oh, PCA is basically like when you multiply something by a matrix, when you do a matrix times a matrix, any matrix times matrix operation, it's linear, unless you have some sort of a nonlinearity in there. Um, otherwise, like any matrix times any other matrix is just linear because it's basically just the sum of all of the individual multiplications. Um, so. So all of the, there, there's no, um, PCA just projects, a, projects one space into another and all of, it always connects by, by straight lines, basically, all the points. Does that make sense? Um, so, but autoencoders, um, so moving, moving back to autoencoders, they, they can. And I'll describe how those are built in just a second. I'll just mention really quickly that autoencoders do something very similar to PCA and can be used for effectively all the same things. Um, but it's a little bit, uh, or a lot better, with dealing with, um, with nonlinearities. Now, before I talk about what an autoencoder is, let's back up and talk about what neural networks are. Can you raise your hand if you're uh, at least casually familiar with neural networks, if you've taken okay, a like good number of you? Um, I'm going to review them at a high level, just because, um, of course, like. Um, just to kind of keep things high level, which is the, the aim of the course. Um, but I'm going to try to describe like succinctly basically what neural networks are. A neural network, like a simple neural network, let's say, is something that looks like this. And what it does is it, it has a set of neurons which carry a value. And uh, so the first set of neurons would, would take an input. So let's say you're dealing with images. They could take the pixels as inputs into the first layer. And what they do is they sort of project the, that data forward and go, it goes through a series of very simple elementary mathematical operations, additions and multiplications, uh, multiplications which are characterized by, uh, by the weights that are attached to each of these connections. So, um, so for example, this neuron right here, and actually just um, ignore the actual numbers because they're wrong. <laughs> these are miscalculated, I just haven't fixed it. Um, the, but but the, the formula is correct though. What's happening here is that you have the input values being multiplied by, by these weights, which are attached to these connections, and then summed together. And then what happens is um, this by itself would be, would be just a simple uh, linear operation, but then we actually, get, in a neural network, we'll attach a nonlinearity to it, which in this case I'm using what's called a sigmoid function, but actually sigmoid functions are almost never used because they're not, um, because they have 
sort of numerical instabilities. And so what we actually usually do is a max operation. So you have neural networks, modern neural networks have nothing more in them, but uh, multi uh, it's like a computational graph, which has the only operations that it has are multiplications, additions, and max operations, um, which are really simple to understand, but of course they have very emergent behavior when you have many of these, because each of these now, like if you have many layers, um, the, uh, the values can, can then recombine in the next layer and give you basically non-linear non like behavior or non-linear behavior. Um, I know that's maybe like a, a mouthful for such a, high, um, for such a high level description, but um, the essence that you should take away from that is that neural networks are a function. It's a function which takes in an input and it goes through a series of, of mathematical operations which are parameterized by weights that we have to figure out what they, what, what they are. And depending on how the weights are set, you get a different kind of behavior, right? So in this case, these values projected forward and gave us this value. But if the weights had been set differently, then we would have had a different answer. And so, the, and so this is kind of the important thing about neural networks. Their behavior is fully uh, parameterized, fully characterized by the weights. Those are the parameters of the, of the function. And um, the, the in, with machine learning, the goal is to learn what those parameters should be in order to perform some task very well. So let me, let me give you a more concrete example. Suppose that we uh, have a data set of images of numbers. Right? So these are all images of numbers. And we want to build an, a, a, um, a machine learning algorithm which will look at these images and tell us what digit is inside of them, right? So for us, this is a trivial task, right? You can, you can see that this is a three, but to a computer, of course, it doesn't have that value written in, it just has a whole bunch of pixels. So to a computer, all of these, all of these individual pixels are meaningless information. Um, how can we design an algorithm to recognize that this is an image of a three? And the way we can do that is using a neural network. So we might construct it in the following way. Suppose you have a neural network with three layers here, or actually two layers. You count layers with, with connections. And the input layer is, uh, you know, you have all of your pixels as inputs. And then you have one or more hidden layers. And, and don't worry about, like, why this has 15 neurons. It's basically arbitrary. Um, just a lot of guess and check. Um, but what's not negotiable is that the last layer has to have exactly 10 neurons. There's one for every uh, possible digit. And we assign each of these neurons to one of the possible classes in our data set. So the classes are the digits, 0 through 9. And the goal is we want this network to behave such that when we have an image of a 9, as this is, that, uh, that after doing all these operations for each neuron and projecting the information forward, what's called a forward pass, we, uh, the 9 neuron has the largest value. And then all of the other neurons have a small value. So that's the goal of tr what's called training a, neur a neural network or training a machine learning algorithm. It's to figure out what set of parameters are going to make it behave in such a way that when we, that we get the right answer at the end. Right? So when we send a 9, we get a high value for a 9. When we send a 2, we get a high value for a 2 and a low value for all of the other, all of the other um, classes. Right? So um, now, of course, at first it's not going to do this. Um, it's just going to have random behavior, but through the process of training the, the, the network, we can learn a set of weights such that, um, uh, such that it has a, high, a relatively high accuracy. And this is what the process of training might look like. So what, what happens is, let's say we have a one-layer neural network, and we start just giving it samples of images, and we tell it the correct answer. So we have a data set which we know uh, that we have the points and we have the classes. So we can feed the network with all these samples and then as it, in the beginning it'll have just random behavior, right? But at every point we can look at see what the, the, correct, the behavior it gives us is and we have some desired behavior. Like let's say we put in an image of a 5 and it'll have just a bunch of random values here at first. But what we want is for the 5 to be 100% and all of the other ones to be 0. We can actually measure the error in our, in our uh, current sort of with the current set of weights that we have. And using calculus, basically, we can figure out uh, what's called a gradient, which is the 
the amount of change we should make in all of the weights such that the error goes down by just a little bit. So this is, this is basically, you can spend 10 years you know, of a PhD like studying this in detail, and I just described it in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> and um, of course, I didn't describe it in much detail, but uh, what you should take away from that is that training involves uh, making small changes to all of the weights by observing the, the behavior of the network and comparing it to the behavior that we want to achieve and uh, adjusting all of the weights so that it, so that it uh, gives us the, more of the behavior that we want. And it's an iterative process. We do this many, many, over many, many samples until we find, um, until we get some set of weights that works reasonably well. Right? How do, does that make sense, roughly, at a high level? Um, <laughs> so I just, just um, to really quickly mention, so like I'm uh, in, I've taught classes where I do a much longer like tutorial over exactly how neural networks work. And um, if you go to this website I mentioned earlier, mlforay.github.io, I've recorded some of my lectures where I'll have an entire class devoted to this. So for people who are interested in, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, mlforay.github.io. Um, I'll put it up on the screen at the end also, um, so like, so, so if you haven't seen it. Uh, it should be, yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, is it not, actually? <laughs> if it's, here, I'll just write it down for you. This is, this is the website, mlforay.github.io. So it, it, um, there's a section in there called classes. I'm um, including the, a class that I taught here called machine learning for artists where um, we go through this much slower. So I have the luxury of, of, um, of kind of describing in more details and, and looking at it every step of the way that, that will probably help you understand this at a deeper level. I'm sorry? Okay, good, good, good. Um, okay, so let's continue. So um, uh, I don't want to talk about this for too much because it's not quite relevant to us, but just to, just to mention a few interesting properties of training. So suppose with this network, we have a one layer network and we only have, we, we don't have any intermediate layers. There's no what are called hidden layers. We can actually visualize the weights. So for this neuron right here, it learn, we can visualize the weights because there are, there's one weight, there's one weight connecting to it for every single pixel that came from the original image, right? So there's, and you can see it doesn't look like there's that many, that's just because I skipped most of them, right? So there's that, there's actually 784. And since there, there, since there's a weight for every pixel for each of these neurons, we can, we can, um, line them up in a square formation, like the same way that the image is. We can, uh, we can visualize it in the same way. And so every pixel, every pixel of this, or I should say every weight here, is like a pixel in this image, which corresponds to a pixel of the input. And if you look at these, they should remind you of something, right? They look kind of like the digits, right? This is what happens as we learn the, the set of weights that will give us a reasonable, accurate, reasonably accurate behavior. And it's kind of interesting, right? It's learning what these, what these digits, what they sort of look like, right? It learns the sort of that, that zeros tend to have, tend to look something like this. And, it's, and it should be kind of intuitively clear why, why this happens, because what, remember what the network wants, what we want for the network to do is to have a very high value for when an image of a zero comes through. And the way it can do that is by having high weights for pixels which tend to be on in images of zeros. And likewise, for images of ones, we want weights to be high for uh, pixels which tend to be on in images of ones, right? Because if we, if we have that, then we would have high weights times high pixels gives us, you know, big numbers times big numbers gives us big numbers, right? Um, and uh, conversely, we want to have, like for example, with this, with this image of the zero, we want to have low weights for pixels which tend to not be on in zeros, but tend to be on in other digits. Because we don't want, it, we don't want the value of this neuron to be high when an image of a 4 comes through. And the 4 tends to have some pixels right in this region. And so by downweighting it, we ensure that images of 4s don't give us inadvertently a high value. Right? So that's kind of like, um, that's basically what's, what's kind of going on here. Um, 
So this is what those, those uh, weights look like, right? Now, um, it turns out this isn't enough fully. Um, what we really need to do is to use what are called convolutional neural networks. And those are exactly as what, everything that we've seen so far, except they make one important innovation, which is that they um, give us what are, uh, they, some of the layers are what are called convolutional layers. Um, and the reason we need this is because most data sets of images, I'll describe what convolution is in just a, in, in one slide, but I'll just mention like first what the problem is. Images of, of let's say cats, right, are not, um, are not as internally consistent as images of sixes or fours or threes are, right? So cats can have different fur patterns and different colors and images of cats can have all sorts of other things cluttered inside of them. Um, there's just a lot more diversity to these images of cats than there are than there is diversity in, in, in images of sixes. And uh, which means that, that uh, you know, a small network is not going to be able to cope with all of that variety and give us good answers. Like if we try to do the same process that we looked at just with, with MNIST, the, these handwritten digits, if we try to do that with uh, images of c cats and deers and dogs and birds, we would get things that look like this, like just blobs, right? Um, because there's really no, like, there's no average image here that, that r really work very well. And um, what, what, what ends up happening is that your, the network doesn't have very good accuracy. But um, by adding what are called convolutional layers, we can actually achieve a much higher accuracy. And convolutional layers are basically at the heart of the, the most uh, accurate you know, neural networks that we, that we have now. Um, they've been kind of like the big story of the last five, ten years has been the emergence of convolutional networks in, in, for uh, all things that have to do with machine learning, um, particularly with images and, and computer vision and so on. And the way convolutional layers work is that they, they're basically almost exactly the same as simple, you know, ordinary neural networks, the kind that we just looked at. Um, but instead of looking for like the whole four or the whole zero or the whole two, it, it, it tries to f find the sort of composition of these images where it looks for features on a small scale. So like a cat, let's say, might, instead of thinking of it as, as like a whole cat, as just a cat, you might think of a cat as being a combination of whiskers and eyes and nose and, and the nose um, and fur and, you know, and so on, right? And what you can do is try to look for each of those things at a smaller level with these sort of filters that we slide across. So this filter might be looking for an eye or something, right? It might have a sort of eye pattern. And you can move it along the image and detect eyes, right? And if you have multiple of these convolutional filters, you can detect multiple kinds of features that, um, that characterize a cat and then recombine them in the next layer to have a high amount of, you know, it, it, you'll see in the next layer that you have many cat-like features. And um, this is the, again, two-second explanation of, of convolutional neural networks, which we only figured out how to make work five years ago. Um, so, <laughs> So obviously there's a lot of details that are missing, but that's, that's kind of the gist of it, right? Um, and um, so like, let, let me, this will become a little bit more clear in the next slide because I'm gonna do a whole demo, okay? So here I have, um, I have my webcam, right? And this is a live convolutional network that's running inside of Open Frameworks. For, any, for anyone here who's using Open Frameworks, this is something that you can run, um, you can download, and we'll be using it on Saturday. Um, so, we have in the first layer a whole set of convolutional filters and they look like this, right? They're all like, they're just looking for these sort of primitive patterns, like small multiple pixel patterns, you know, maybe like, maybe like parallel lines or, or small edges or gradients. And for each of these filters, we have a, an activation map. So here you see, this is basically like the presence of this filter in my webcam image. And so you see some of the filters are finding what appear to be like horizontal lines. And some of them are finding vertical edges. Some of them are finding diagonal lines. Or maybe some of them are finding like more sort of patchy, consistent colors, like this one, let's say. And, um, and so this is what we, we just have this, we have this set of filters that gives us these responses in the first layer. Um, now here's, here's where things will, will get a little tricky.
Um, we, in the second layer, we do another round of convolution on top of those responses. So basically, we have a new set of filters, which are looking for patterns in, of the, in the activation maps that we had in the first layer. So here's a bunch of patterns, right? And maybe, maybe like in, in some part of this image plane has kind of like a horizontal line here and the vertical line here. Well, in the second filter, in the second convolutional layer, you might have a, a, a filter which is, looking for, which is looking for just that, like sort of these horizontal and vertical lines coming together and forming corners. Right? So um, this is kind of the essence of deep learning. So if you hear deep learning a lot and you wonder what's so deep about it, deep learning means multiple layers of neural networks where at each layer you're learning a more sophisticated, more high level representation of the previous layer. So in the first layer we learn sort of primitive features in, which are just you know, edges and gradients. In the second layer we can learn corners or lattices or parallel lines or perpendicular lines right, and, and sort of more complicated features. In the third layer we can learn yet even more complex features and, and all the while we're reducing the amount of information and basically compressing it to a more high level uh, a more high level representation which should sound familiar because that's exactly what we did with principal component analysis. We tried to represent the, the, the data with fewer numbers which are individually much more meaningful, right? In, in the sense that they're looking for sort of salient features, which, which are patterns, right? And so in this convolutional network, it's already trained, right? We uh, do a, a series of convolutions until we get to the end here. And, and actually, we can, look at, we can look at some of these, right? So now they, they don't really look like, they're not making much sense anymore to us, right? So you see like these features, um, there's still, you can see kind of still me in them, right? Um, but now the features um, are lighting up for more complicated objects. So, so if you go to like, if you go all the way down to, um, uh, I like showing, showing off Conv 156. Yeah, here's 156. So does th that look like something to you? That's a face. It's a face filter, right? So that seems to be my face, and I'll prove it to you because if I, if I like, you know, close, if I, it'll it'll go away, right? So it's not like a skin filter; it doesn't detect my hands; it's detecting my face, right? And um, that's pretty interesting, right? Because we didn't tell it to look for faces; it simply learned that um, to make filters such that when you recombine them after many layers of convolutions that it, it ends up lighting up for faces and not lighting up for non-faces. So this is, kind of, um, this is kind of really neat. And, and the reason why it did that with faces is because this data set was trained on a lot of images, many of which have faces. So it has things like dogs and cats and people in them. And the network learned that if you want to represent these things as fewer numbers, maybe you can try to look for faces and then, be, and then have a high value if you find faces. So this is a sort of form of compression, right? And it ends up being very useful for the task of classification. And then at the end here, we'll have like a fully connected layer, which is, which is to say that we take all of, those, all of those activations and we flatten them out so that we just have a bunch of neurons. And then at the end, we attach a classification layer and we have, you know, neck brace, right? So like, uh, you know, I'll put my phone in front of it, handheld computer, Cellular telephone, iPod. Do you see the iPod there? Um, usually it does a little, there you go, iPod. Right, and I can like, yeah, I can maybe see what else we can put in front of it. A beaker, right? That's pretty close, right? Um, I wonder what this will look like. Maybe. A washer. A barbell. That's kind of that's kind of that makes sense, right? Um, well, in any in any case, so so you see that it's um, you see that this is it's pretty decent at doing image classification over a thousand classes, right? So this has a, a, a sort of built-in vocabulary. It may lack a lot of classes, but for one thousand classes, it it actually has a lot, and it does a pretty decent job of classification. So this is 
a convolutional neural network in, in 15 minutes, right? So that's that's kind of what we, what we just described. Um, I'm just going to, I think I'll skip these. Um, so there's, a, there's a few things that are interesting to note about convolutional networks. So you can actually, um, you can visualize what each of these neurons are learning. So for example, in the first layer, where we have, you know, very, really simple weights, we can actually, um, we can produce a set of, of uh, we can look at image patches, which, uh, from real images, which when they pass through the network, they, they make a particular neuron fire very high. So this filter right here is looking for what looks like a sort of, you know, a diagonal line, right? And these right here, these images, these three, these nine patches, they correspond to actual like subsets of real images which um, make this neuron fire very high, right? So you can see that, that what the filters do is that they're looking for things that look like themselves, basically, right? And so you see like this neuron right here is just looking for a sort of consistent patch of green. And so anywhere where you have a little patch of green, you have, um, it'll, it'll light up, right? Now in the first layer, that makes plenty of sense, right? You can, you can kind of see that they look, you know, they look just like the filters. But as you go multiple layers deep into the network, you can't really visualize the filters anymore because they're, they're, they're formed upon multiple, sort of multiple operations now. So we can't even remember what all of the, all of the operations were. And so, um, but what you, you can still do the same procedure and look to see what patches of real images make certain neurons respond. And if you do that, you'll see that, they, that, it, that it gives you a sort of visual intuition for what the neurons are actually learning. So for example, this is like a second layer convolution. And this neuron seems to like sort of, um, I don't know, rings, right? It's, it's finding rings here, right? And this neuron seems to like sort of parallel vertical lines, right? This neuron seems to like lattices, you know, grids. And this one is responding towards car wheels. And maybe this one over here is responding to people or, or just upper bodies of people, actually. Um, and so you can see that these neurons, they, after multiple layers of convolutions and, and, and other operations, they're actually learning to detect very, very high level information, like information which is perceptually meaningful to us. Right? And that's kind of, um, that's been really the revolution in machine learning of the last sort of 10 years, that we're now able to do this. And um, for anyone, you know, it, it, like if you're wondering why machine learning all of a sudden became a big deal, it's that in the like 1990s and in the 2000s, we, uh, we couldn't really do this. We couldn't really do it very well in the way that what you just saw um, because uh, we didn't understand how to train these really deep neural networks. Um, and so what we used to use was sort of sh more shallow algorithms and we would do a lot of the work ourselves in finding a representation. And you usually, oftentimes, using things like PCA. So we would do some pre-processing and look for, like, in computer vision, you would look for some, you would use computer vision, like, um, libraries that detect edges and, and you know, sort of, um, like, like, really standard uh, image filters, and then combine them in, and then throw those into some shallow neural network or um, a support vector machine or some other algorithm, which was, um, much more shallow, like we just have sort of one layer of processing. Now we've taken all of that, the, you know, finding features and, and, and sort of doing all this feature detection, and we've swallowed it into the learning algorithm itself. So now um, we're able to actually learn this really, this really effective representation entirely from pixels, just raw pixels which is really neat because then it turns out that we can do, we can basically run the same algorithms almost entirely unchanged on different kinds of data. So it doesn't have, just have to be images, it could be audio, it can be text, it can be pretty much anything, right? So this has kind of been one of the really interesting things that, that have happened. Does anyone have any questions so far, right? Um, we're, yeah? Uh, yeah, what was it? What was it at the end? Would you say? Yeah. 
There's there's just uh, one model, but it just basically is much deeper. It has many sort of processing steps uh, because before, like you would like this and this are equivalent, except this would be kind of small, and because it's small, it couldn't learn, you know, really complex image classes. So you'd have to do a lot of work to make the representation of the data already high level before even putting it into the learning algorithm. So that would come in the, in the form of known computer vision algorithms or, or audio processing if you were doing audio stuff. Whereas now we can actually just throw in raw media, which is very unstructured and you know, has very little sort of perceptually meaningful qualities. And, and it will basically do the job of finding features. It's kind of just swallowed this in, in some sense. Does that, does that answer your question roughly? Yeah. Well, in in the well, it's not trying everything by brute force because that would take too long, but it is um, it is capable of using anything, and it is essentially cutting. Th it is trying to find that combination of parameters, which um, you know, which which would achieve the task very well. Well, the, the model is the filters, you could say, um, and there are, there's many of them, many, many, many filters, um, maybe hundreds of thousands, even millions. Um, so they're very, very deep in that sense. Yeah. Um, any others? So, um, so, okay, now we're back to where we left off with autoencoders, right? So. Um, now, I don't expect that everyone understands all of the ins and outs of, of convolutional networks, but if, if for, for everything that we just looked at, just encapsulate that information into the following takeaways. You have a, uh, a, you know, a function which takes as an input an image, and it can learn a representation of that image uh, through a sequence of layers of which are progressively more and more high level. Uh, a representation of that image, which is, is which is useful for a particular task, which is good at, um, you know, in the in the examples we looked at, it was good for classification, right? So here's how an autoencoder builds upon this. An autoencoder is a neural network whose job is not to uh, do classification or regression. Um, it's not trying to predict any anything about the data. Its job is to uh, is, is to essentially reconstruct the data. So if you have, let's say, let's say these neurons take in an image, these are the, its pixels, the, they, they will go forward, they'll project through this neural network as usual, through a series of layers, and then at, on the other side, re-emerge and hopefully be roughly equal, exactly equal to the input. So we want the output to be a reconstructed version of the input. So just exactly equal to the input. So there's no labels anymore. Now this may seem like really silly, like why would we want to do this, right? It's just basically like a really, really, really expensive version of times one, right? Um, the world's most expensive identity function, is my joke. Um, well, the reason why this is useful is suppose we constructed the network in such a way that somewhere in the middle, we had a kind of bottleneck. Like we had some layer somewhere which is really small. Like it has maybe just a few neurons. Like in this visual, you just have three, right? And it could be, you know, even 10 or 100 or whatever. That's still really small compared to the number of pixels that we have. And so if you do that, um, then you are effectively forcing the network to, to be able to learn a very, very efficient representation of the original data. You're forcing the network to learn an encoder, basically, like this first half, we can interpret it as an encoder. It has to encode any image that comes through it in such a way that once we have it in this middle layer, the decoder is able to reconstruct it from a very small amount of information. Right? Um, so the only way it can do that is by doing essentially what we were what we were saying the principal component analysis did it learns the sort of salient features of the image uh, 
and um, and it compresses the image so that it you know so we wring out all of the extraneous data except for that um, except for that very high level the the sort of high level characteristics which are which are useful for the task of reconstruction. So uh, we can call that Z. Sometimes we'll call this like a latent space, right? This is kind of like a code that the encoder takes an image and produces. So we take an image, the encoder creates this code, and it's a very, very small compressed representation of the image. And then the decoder takes a code, like the code that, that, we, that we compressed originally, and reconstructs that code into the, into, uh, back into pixel space. So if you think about this, this is basically equivalent to what principal component analysis did, right? If we go back a bunch of slides, we effectively had an encoder and a decoder. The encoder was, let's just go back to it. Yeah, the encoder is this, right? So it's basically, mult, we're project, we have this projection matrix, which projects it down to some small subspace. And the decoder, is exactly the opposite. It's the and it's just the, tr the the inverse of the of the projection matrix that goes back into pixel space. So we do this exact same thing, except we do it with an autoencoder instead. And the autoencoder turns out to do a much better job of it than PCA because it's nonlinear. So it can represent the data. Uh, it, it can it can better fit data which is distributed in sort of non um, nonlinear ways. Right. So let me just get back to where we started. If you do this, right, let's say you do, did it on a data set of images of numbers, right, you'll get something uh, that looks like this, right? You have, a, you have this data set of numbers and we can learn an autoencoder such that it takes these images and reconstructs them on the other side. And you see like, okay, so this four comes out and gives us a reconstructed version of the four and it's not perfect. And, and usually what you notice with these uh, autoencoders is that they're very, they're very, what's going on here? Uh, okay, hang on a second. So here you see you have these digits, and um, what comes out on the other side are just like really, um, you know, are, are reconstructions of it, and they're not very good, but but it's impressive that it's able to do this considering that we have some central bottleneck somewhere. So that implies that we are forming a really a good representation of the images in this hidden layer somewhere. Okay. So what happens now um, is that we're going to complicate things even more. And I'm going <laughs> to tell you why. Um, we're going to now introduce generative adversarial networks. Now generative adversarial networks, which I'm going to spend about two minutes describing what they do, were only discovered uh, or like invented in 2014 by this guy named Eden Goodfellow. Um, and they're really kind of at the cutting edge of, of a lot of machine learning, especially this year. It's been a really big year for GANs, as we, as we um, say sometimes, GANs. And what generative adversarial networks do is um, they're very, for us, we can kind of view them as very similar to autoencoders. They have a sort of encoder and a decoder except they're constructed a little bit differently. So with most neural networks, what we usually tend to, to do is um, we, we train them with some objective function, right? Um, so to minimize some error or to, um, you know, to, to have some sort of inaccuracy, right? With generative adversarial networks, we have this procedure where we have two neural networks now. One is called a generator and one is called a discriminator. For all intents and purposes, the generator is basically equivalent to the decoder part of our autoencoder. It takes a like a, a, a sort of input vector, which we call sometimes like a latent vector or a latent um, latent code, and it will uh, the, it takes that as an input, and then uh, and its output it produces a sample of data, and the um, then but now the difference is we also have a second neural network which is called a discriminator. And a discriminator is, is, for all intents and purposes, is just a classifier. And what it does is its, its job is to tell us, its job is to basically tell us whether or not the image that was produced by the generator is real or fake. 
or, or rather it's to detect um, if the image is coming from the generator. So the, what happens is you have some data set of images. So let's say you have this huge data set and you can train the generator and discriminator in this sort of in this in the in this process where they're kind of locked in competition. The generator is trying to learn a uh, is a neural network that's trying to learn a way to take these input codes and generate real images from them. And the discriminator is tr is trying to um, basically tell uh, whether or not the image it's receiving came from the original data or from the generator. So another the the metaphor that's often used is the generator is like a counterfeiter, and the discriminator is like the policeman or something, um, or or the bank. And um, by training them in this sort of um, competitive process, hence they're called adversarial. That's where the adversarial comes from. At some point, the generator becomes really, really, really good at making samples of images that look as though they came from the original data. Right. So um, now we're going to get now things are going to get really weird. Um, <laughs> so we, we already saw some samples of faces generated by PCA. They weren't particularly convincing. Well, in late 2015, this paper came out by these guys and it introduced the notion of a deep convolutional generative adversarial network, DC GAN. Um, and uh, they were they trained it on a data set of faces. And they, they in, in an adversarial way, so they had a they had a generative adversarial network. And what GANs do is they actually learn how to do this way better than autoencoders. They come up with samples that are no longer blurry. They actually are very crisp and clear. And, um, and oh, what is happening to my laptop? Uh, <laughs> well, anyhow. Um, Yeah, just let that be zoomed in. Uh, <laughs> what is going on here? I think it's maybe because I have too many things running, possibly. Um, well, anyhow, um, they learn how to generate faces that look like kind of real, right? Um, and and I, I don't know, these are really sort of weird looking. They're kind of gnarly, right? Um, so. Um, but they're way better than auto uh, autoencoders, and you notice that all of these like they're they're kind of approaching the uncanny valley, right? It like looks convincingly like a human face. It's just kind of weird. Some of them are really like discolored or or kind of distorted, and um, but but they're but they're actually like pretty impressive that it, that that the generator is able to do this. And if you um, but there but things get even weirder. Okay, so basically. What generative adversarial networks do, and, and autoencoders do this to some extent as well, is that they give you a sort of interpretable latent space. So that that latent that that bottleneck in the middle, you can think of as the you know as the encoding that we have, like a code that represents a, a, a an image in the set. It it has because it's learned this very high level encoding of these images. It, the, it carries a lot of information, and so if you change the, the you know, you can think of the, the codes like, like knobs. You know, as you kind of twist them, you will change the salient properties of the image that it's producing. And not only that, but you can actually perform arithmetic on them. So this is, this is an actual figure from the paper. Um, so if you find, you know, you train this, this GAN to produce images of faces of people, and you find the latent code which produces, you know, smiling women, right? So this is a find. They found some part of the generator space that produces images of smiling women, and they subtracted the vector. For, they took that latent. They, they 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 took that code and they subtracted the code which can produce images of neutral women, which just means non-smiling women, right? <laughs> and then added the vector uh, for neutral man. And then what you get is, of course, the, the wom woman minus woman cancels out. And then <laughs> you have the smiling, mi uh, so you have negative neutral plus neutral. The neutral cancels out, and you're left with smiling man. And right, so this is smiling man. And um, this kind of arithmetic actually works like really consistently well um, with, with DC GANs. And um, there's lots of examples in the paper that you can look through, um, which, is, which is really neat. And um, they they just showed some of the most 
weird like um you know so this is this is equivalent to what what i tried to do earlier with pca with interpolating between faces um this is they're doing the same thing but of course like now they're much more realistic and all of the intermediate stages are are actually like um are are you know changing high like gradually changing high level features of the um of the image right so like for example you know like one like a the person's hair might change color throughout the interpolation like go from from dark hair to bright to light hair um, or something like that which is which is really um pretty neat um i use their software my computer is really really slow right now what is going on <laughs> Okay, hang on a second. We're we're um, we have we're getting close to the sort of the uh, where things get really weird actually. So <laughs> it just gets weirder um, because we're we're getting we're we're now in 2016, and once we get to 2017, it's just going to be outrageous. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I use this. Um, so they released. Oh, okay, so they released. Um, this software in late 2015, and I used it to uh, quote unquote interpolate numbers. So here, what's going on is that I'm I'm actually um, I trained it trained a DCGAN on those images of numbers that we saw, and you see that you can you can cruise this sort of generative space, you know, messing with these knobs, and you can also interpolate between classes. So you can condition them on classes, and produce realistic looking numbers in between other numbers. So you see that this kind of animation is possible to make. Um, I did this on the, I showed this a little bit last year. I did a, a, um, a project where I found a data set of handwritten Chinese characters and then trained a DCGAN to produce them. So you can see here that like, it's able to basically learn how to forge these, uh, forge these characters. Um, I got a lot of help from a, a good friend of mine who's actually um, helping me with ML for A writing. So maybe some of you guys know him. He's taught some classes here as well, Francis Tseng. Um, and basically, one of the cool things that he told me about is what's, this, what's going on here? Uh, okay, maybe that that slide's broken. Um, so you can do these interpolations between different characters, and um, the cool thing that I found—I don't want to belabor this this project because it's not relevant to the rest of the lecture. But uh, one of the cool things about it is that um, Chinese characters are made up of radicals. So there's like 214 root characters that that are at the root of every of every um, Chinese character. And if you do interpolations among groups of related characters, sometimes the radical is kind of preserved. I'm cherry picking the ones that work, but, but it more or less kind of, um, kind of works. This is, this is some stuff done by other people. Other people train DC again on manga. And again, you can, like, um, you can do these interpolations between different you know, hallucinated manga characters. This is all like from 2015. Um, so this is, when I made that project, that was right here. GANs have exploded um, in the last year and a half. There's been tons of different papers, new kinds of GANs. They're all just kind of building on top of um, what was learned in, in previous iterations. And um, this is the state of the art. So this is a BGAN, boundary equilibrium GAN. And these are all totally synthetic. These are not real people, right? Um, so that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty uncanny, right? So now we're, we're making like basically photorealistic samples of people, people's faces. Um, and that's all stuff that, that's basically emerged over the last year. I'll just show you a few more interesting kinds of GANs. So there's InfoGAN. This is um, information maximizing GAN. They, the authors, um, so like in most kinds of GANs before, like in DC GAN, you have this generative space you can play with, but it's not very structured in a meaningful way. You kind of have to find codes that are, that are relevant to your task. And um, here, they're using, they're, they're trying to, by maximizing um, this metric of like mutual information between different, uh, between different dimensions of the latent space, they're able to um, essentially learn a representation, a much more structured latent space, such that like one dimension of the latent space might control, for example, the rotation of a generated sample, or maybe the width of it, or, um, you know, in, in making different faces, one might actually control the, the pose like the, of the face or the elevation or the rotation and so on. Um, disco GANs learn how to essentially do style transfer. So here they can like, um, in a totally unsupervised way, train it on a bunch of handbags 
and then produce shoes that have uh, the same style as the handbag, right? Or they can change the gender of these images, right? This is like an image of a woman and it's been gendered male, right? Or vice versa. So this is like really, really uncanny valley territory, right? Um, stack GANs are able to produce photorealistic images from text captions that you give it. So we haven't really talked so much about like text, but um, you can condition these GANs on many different kinds of media. So here, in this case, they're using something called a skip dot vector, which I'm actually going to talk about in a few slides, to produce, um, to, to basically um, encode a description of something and then produce an image from it. And they use a kind of a two-step process, um, which results in really, really amazing. So you, you just basically can write some caption. This bird is white, black, and brown in color with a brown beak. And it produces a realistic looking image. And the same thing with flowers. Again, these are all fake. Right? So this is stat guns. Um, they can do interpolations between different skip dot vectors. So here on one side, you have the bird is completely red and the bird is completely yellow. Actually, they spelled completely wrong, but, um, but basically this does an interpolation between red birds and yellow birds. And here this is, the bird is completely red with black wings and pointy beak. The small blue bird is a short pointy beak and brown on its wings. Um, so, so just really, really wild, um, wild stuff, right? Art GANs um, are able to synthesize images of different artists. So this, if you, re, if you look up this paper, they've generated artworks based on the styles of different artists. So this is like uh, Albert Durer, um, Camille Pissarro. Yeah, you might recognize some of these artists. Um, and then, of course, like the follow-up to that is just from a few days ago is GAN Go. So this is a GAN which produces um, artwork in the style of Vincent van Gogh. And it's really kind of cool, like... Uh, I, I, I sometimes wonder if like maybe to some degree they're picking the subject of the title because it, it might have a catchy name. Like I think that's what some of these are actually doing. Um, deep generating hours, how am I doing on time? 7.35, okay. So we have like 20, yeah, yeah. yeah. Question about yes. Like, scans in general, like photorealistic. Is it possible that it's just learning to like reproduce the images in the data set exactly? So like with the credit, Totally, yeah. So that is a concern. So that's called overfitting, and it's something that machine learning scientists struggle with. So you, you want to, the, the goal is, of course, to not do that. You want to be able to um, not overfit. Of course, like if, if you were doing that, then it would be the case that you're just generating samples from the data set. And um, the, in machine learning, one thing that's often done is what's called regularization, which are basically techniques to try to avoid from overfitting. Um, there are many such techniques, and this is, it's kind of a little bit beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today, but, but you're correct that, that that's something that like, um, has to be thwarted, and there's a constant sort of um, struggle to do machine learning. Good question. Yeah. Any others? Um, so deep generator networks, these are from a few months ago, produced photorealistic samples over many, many images. So these are swimming trunks and cheeseburgers and sandbars, and they're actually very high resolution images as well. And um, we can actually like animate, uh, we, we can actually look at some of the, oh, this is really slow again. <laughs> I don't know what is going on. Um, let me just actually skip this slide because I just don't have enough time. So let's, let's just look at some of the classes. So it, it can produce, so these are buttes, right? They're, they're kind of like um, these sort of canyon-like features that we have a lot in the, in the west of, our, of the, the US. And um, you see that like every sample is kind of novel and it differs a little bit from the previous sample. And so it's just this, this, this um, generative model which produces um, realistic looking, I mean, you know, it's a little bit cartoonish, like you're not gonna think that it's a photograph yet, but it's pretty impressive the, um, the sort of how well it can make sort of, you know, per perceivably, um, something that looks perceptibly to us like, um, like a butte. Right? And these are boathouses. And I like to include this in every time I talk about deep generator networks because one neat thing about this is you notice that, like, that the water has reflections. So the network is able to learn like, really, really subtle things, like that water has reflections. So that's something that's pretty, pretty neat. This is the discotheque, of course. Yes. 
um, and you can animate the process of finding the input code. Like I haven't talked about how these are made, um, but there's a process by which you have to find the input to the network which will produce a particular kind of sample. Like for example, the one that produces a cheeseburger, um, and then this one that produces a teapot. This actually should not be so slow, but um, yeah, teapot. <laughs> Um, so, um, a, uh, a former student of mine named Sam Haynes is actually going to be a student here at ITP. Is anyone here starting at ITP in the fall or is a current student? Not, not most people. Okay. People are here just for a summer. Well, anyway, this is an incoming student here who made a, the saddest Twitter account in the world. It's called Zero Likes. It's, a, it's, it's basically a, um, a generative model that's trained on um, images from, scraped from Instagram which have zero likes. On them, so it's, it's really like, and then it uses a captioning library to to caption it. So this is a man takes a picture of himself. So you can and you can kind of see there's like a person holding a camera. I don't know if you, it's kind of like if you ever take it like if you go to like a psychologist and they show you those like paintings, or uh, what is that? Oh, exactly, yeah, those those things. Um, you know, and they ask you to interpret it. I think that's kind of what's happening here. So I'll show you another one. This is a, a dog looks at a cat in the mirror, which is, which is like, first of all, that's like a, a resting thought. Like, a dog looks at a cat in the mirror? What does that mean? <laughs> and you can see, the, you can see the, the cat here. I think that's right there. You kind of see. And then there's the dog. I see a dog, like a nose there. Um, and then it even learns the Instagram filters. You see, like, the cheesy border is happening. Um, these are video prediction GANs. I'm going to skip this just because we're running out of time. Um, yeah, it is cool. Okay, I want to move on to Pix to Pix. Um, how many people are familiar with Pix to Pix? This kind of made waves the last few months, some of you. So this is a, a generative model that uses a, that basically uses a, um, it's a, it's a GAN, it's a generative adversarial network, except it's, it's a conditional GAN. So it's actually, um, it isn't, the, the data actually, um, it, it isn't, uh, the generator is not just a function of some input code, like some, some latent variable, but it's actually a function of another image. So basically, you can create these GANs which work as essentially image filters. So it takes as an input an image and produces another kind of image. And the kind of relationship between the input and output image is one that you specify through the training set. So suppose you have a data set, a parallel data set of maps, and satellite images, right? So here you have maps, and here you have satellite images. You can learn a mapping between, you, you can teach a, 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 the generator to take an image of a map and produce the corresponding satellite imagery. So like, let's say you have a data set of, of maps and satellite imagery, you can learn how to map one to the other. And so then it can take in a new map and produce realistic satellite imagery. Or maybe in the other way around, maybe it takes satellite imagery, which we have plenty of, and produces some sort of a custom map. So you can imagine this could be really useful if you're working with a lot of map data. Or maybe you're an architecture student and you want to be able to like mock up a design for a building and then um, create a corresponding facade, right? So like here you have, um, you know, the windows have been labeled light blue and um, you know you have like um, like here you have uh, the the ledges are red, and then it generates a facade like an, a realistic looking image um, of a building facade, which is conditioned on these labels. So you can make a design and then create the and you can texture it right. So this is like the design software of the future. You'll be able to very quickly create um, realistic looking imagery from mockups right. And you can imagine, of course, uh, how useful it would be to be able to derive, to go the other way around, to, to derive label maps from images. For example, for, for self-driving cars, you often want to take a camera feed and produce a label map where, you know, the cars are blue and the trees are green and the road is purple and so on. Because that would be useful for a, a self-driving car to be able to simplify the information that it's looking at so that it can make decisions very quickly. Um, or maybe, uh, the, and then some of them are really just weird. Like, like this one is learning how to take images of daytime scenes and turn them into nighttime scenes, right? So this, is the, this has been a generated image conditioned on this, which is the nighttime version of this image, which is really wild, right? If you think about it, like it's, it's, uh, 
you, it's not just darkening the image. It's actually like you see like lampposts coming out. Um, so it's learning how to basically um, you know, do this kind of like very, very perceptually uh, meaningful stuff. It's basically like a generic image filter, which you can train to, to learn whatever it is that you're you know, interested in learning. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You need exact pairs. And, and then we'll see in a few slides, like the, the, there's ways to get around this. Um, so I did the, I used the, I did this for um, sorry I made a project with a collaborative project with some actually some participants in the workshop called Invisible Cities. So what we did was we trained multiple generative models to from uh, on Mapbox tiles. You guys maybe know Mapbox, which is a sort of open source version of Google Maps, right? And we took a few cities, we took their map and maps and satellite data, and we learned these generative models. And then you can do a sort of city style transfer by inputting the map of one city into the generative model of another city, right? So here you're taking uh, Milan and you're restyling it in the style of, Ven uh, of Venice or in the style of Los Angeles, right? Um, which is pretty wild, right? Um, and um, and uh, so this is, this is kind of, uh, this is the process by which, um, so here you can see like if you try to, if you train the Venice model, and then you take its label map and run it through the model, you'll get a reconstruction of Venice, which looks like kind of, you know, more or less realistic, right? Um, which, is, which is pretty neat. And then, of course, you can then just do this sort of style transfer. So this is Los Angeles in the style of Venice, where the roads have become like waterways. The roads are now canals here. And here's Milan in the style of Venice, right? And uh, more, more of this city style transfer technique. And then, of course, you can just put in anything you want. You can just start making uh, just drawing maps on construction paper and then putting them into the network and just generating like synthetic terrains. So this is the kind of stuff that you can do with pix to pix and it's been used in a lot of such projects. Um, some of you might have seen this on the internet floating around the edges to cat. Anyone play with this? Um, so this is kind of, this was using pix to pix So it's training a model to go from a sketch and give you a sort of cat-like object. Uh, and then this was just last week. This also went viral. Someone made a portrait creator. So it goes from you draw a sketch and it, and it gives you a portrait, right? Um, and um, and of course it was trained, I think, on like one person or something like that. Um, so that, that's kind of like the kind of stuff that you can do with pix to pix I'm going to skip through some of this just because I don't, I'm running out of time. So <laughs> and we want to get to some, um, some more um, pix to pix examples. So uh, an artist named Mario Klingemann did a really neat thing. He trained pix to pix on, um, fi uh, basically he took uh, these like old sketches from the Smithsonian or something, I don't know where they came from. Um, and he extracted their faces using a face detector. And then he trained the pix to pix model to go from the face detected, like the face contour, to the sketch, right? And then, so what I did with this idea was I trained a um, I, tr I basically took a speech of, of, of some guy here giving a speech and I've extracted his face um, with a face detector and I trained the model to go from the face to, uh, to, to go from the face landmarks points that are found to, uh, to the actual face and then put myself in front of the camera, extract the face detector from my face and then run that through the generative model that produced, that produced this um, imagery. And so if you do that, it basically we're just going really slow. You have basically a meat puppet. Um, I installed this um, at a workshop in in um, Switzerland. I don't know why the video is like super slow, um, but basically, like you can do this real time. It works live. Um, I have like a little bit of a delay going on here. Um, you notice actually when someone leaves the camera, you just have like a sort of like a suit and tie with a severed head because it can't see anything, which is really weird. And then someone comes up to it and then you just get like, yeah, it's hideous, the most hideous thing on the internet. Um, uh, Mimo Acton um, is a really good artist. He, he made a, he also did um, a version of the same thing. Basically, he trained a, again a, a pix to pix model on, on images of paintings from museums. And he released some software. He actually released the software that does this, so you can do this real time. So you train a pix to pix model, and then you can put yourself underneath the camera and be, um, you know, running, running sort of this model. 
Um, Cycle again is um, the latest and greatest version of Pix to Pix. So Pix to Pix, here's the, the limitation of Pix to Pix is that it requires paired images. So there was a question about this earlier. So here, so Pix to Pix requires that the images that you train on be paired. So like a satellite map, a map in the satellite imagery, right? It's like it's basically the same structure except different different views of it, right? And a lot of times, um, that's really it's really hard to obtain paired examples of something that you want to be able to convert. So for example, suppose that for some reason you wanted to convert horses into zebras. Um, well, you can imagine trying to train a pix to pix model on this. You'll have to take a whole bunch of photos of horses, and then take and then go find a bunch of zebras and make them stand in the exact same position as the horse. I don't know if you guys know, like zebras are not into being made to stand in certain kinds of positions, like super not into it. And so obviously this doesn't work very well. And this cycle GAN uh, is basically like pix to pix, except it doesn't require the la the 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 um, the samples, the image samples, to be paired. It, you just give it a folder of images of horses and the folder of images of zebras, and it will learn how to convert images of zebras into horses and images of horses into zebras, right? Or it can turn photos into paintings or paintings into photos, or it can give you different seasons. It'll take an image of mountains in the summer and turn it into its corresponding winter photograph. So that's really, really wild, I think, right? And it can do style transfer as well. So that's kind of like, it's really, really capable. Um, there was this photo that they released that went viral of them basically turning a horse into a zebra. And one neat thing about this, if you, if you notice, is that the horse is, uh, every time the zebra sort of passes by the pole, um, the pole gets striped. Do you notice that? The, like the pole? Because it can't tell where the, the, the zebra ends and the rest of the world begins. And so that creates for some really like funny failures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many photos are in the In Cycle Again, it was like something like a thousand for each one. Not too many. Like, and in Pix to Pix, like, you can get away with like even just a hundred or two hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it really like, there's no generic number because it depends on the complexity of the mapping that you're trying to learn. And also, um, these don't work so well at spatially changing things they like like they can do really well at changing textures of things but you can't for example turn a dog into a cat um, very well you can try but it, it like it doesn't work so well that's what they found the authors found um, now uh, we've been focusing on images I just want to really briefly mention that like generative models exist in other domains as well this is from a paper called skip thought vectors which learn to encode sentences into a vector space and they're trained on basically to try to predict the sentences are trained to try to predict a sentence that neighbors it. You know, maybe the next sentence or the previous sentence, or maybe on some natural language task. And um, these are called skip thought vectors, which is a really, really uh, cool, I don't know, kind of a cool concept, like embedding thoughts in a vector space. And of course, we, we, we saw earlier how we could take text and produce image samples from it. Um, skip thought vectors were the input to that network. So. Um, so yeah, essentially, there's there's kind of a relationship between the two. Um, so this was they um, so this was done by a researcher named Jamie Ryan Kiros, who then um, released this software called Neural Storyteller, which combines skip thought vectors with recurrent neural networks, which we haven't talked about, um, and convolutional networks to basically tell stories about images. So here, this is a, a photo of a beach, and then on, a, a neural network automatically tells a story about it. And the story is, we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach, and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind. Um, she was in love with him for the first time in months, so she had no intention of escaping. The sun had risen. I think it was trained on like romance novels or something, so that's why, that's why it's like beach love stories. Um, and then the, um, this artist named Samim um, uh, used Neural Storyteller and trained it on Taylor Swift lyrics. And then, so this is like, like I'm standing right now, man, it's going to be a sidewalk in the street. I thought, oh my God, I don't see you walking away. So that's apparently what Taylor Swift sounds like. Um, uh, wave nets are generative models in the audio domain. So here they're able to produce The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 speech. American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. Now we've been able to do that for a long time, like to generate speech, but it was always using physical models, which is basically like written, you know, programs written by hand 
to create audio. Um, here, we're actually able to learn audio from any audio, like learn how to produce audio from from any data set of audio that we can give it, just recordings. So they, they also showed that you can, for example, like play jazz. You can train it on jazz music. I just want to stress that that isn't real. That was like not recorded. That was syn synthesized by a neural network. It doesn't have a lot of like long-term memory, so it, it's sort of just like a stream of consciousness piano playing. It sounds kind of like, like um, uh, I don't know, um, kind of impressionistic music. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm gonna skip some of this stuff. Um, there's an open source version of this that's not quite as good as the results that DeepMind had. Um, I trained it on Opera. So that's generative opera. Um, it's really it's my masterpiece, right? So um, skip this. Um, there's a really cool project called Nsynth, which is made by this group at Google called Magenta, where they have uh, learned using the, a WaveNet-like architecture, learned generative models of audio of, instru of, of musical instruments. So um, you can do things like combine flutes. Uh, you can combine different musical instruments. Um, let's see how I'm doing. It has so 755. Have deep dream stuff. Um, okay, I think I think maybe we should just stop there. I'm going to. I'll just really quickly mention deep dream um, because um, this was all about you know from from uh, pixels to from principal components to puppy slugs. So the whole puppy slug thing comes from deep dream. This was uh, something that was deep dream was coined by Google a year and a, or about two years ago around this time, and it actually uh, very much follows. Uh, some research that had been going on for a year or two leading up to that, which basically involves um, doing things like synthesizing images, which uh, which make a neural network think uh, that that it ha that it is of a particular class. So, for example, if you ask, you know, if you have a neural network which can detect bananas, right? A question you might have is, what sort of image would make um, a would uh, you know would maximally activate the banana neuron, right? Um, and it looks something like this, right? And it uses this optimization technique where you, it's almost like, it's almost like training a neural network where you're, you're learning the gradient of something. You know, with training a neural network, you learn the gradient of the weights. But here, you learn the gradient of the pixels, and then you change the pixels so as to maximize um, a particular, or so, so as to maximize some objective function, which is, uh, of a, neural, which is um, a neural network recognizing this as a banana. Um, and... Um, you know, they, this was like, if you, uh, how many people saw this when it came out, Deep Dream? So maybe a good number of you. Um, basically, it lets you do things like this to images, right? So um, to, to try to enhance some of the features that the neural network thinks it sees. And um, you can take images, like this is a sketch by Leonardo da Vinci, and Deep Dream them. Right? So you see, like, these are, and, and so if you're wondering what are the puppy slugs, that's these guys right here. Here are the puppy slugs. Um, and um, and yeah, this is this is just like a lot of like really interesting um, interesting stuff kind of coming out. Uh, one of the researchers who worked on it named Mike Tyka, um, he did a lot. He made a lot of crazy artwork with with this. I'm working on a. Uh, I'm been working with this recently as well. I was gonna show some of it, but I think we're kind of out of time, so I'll probably save that for um, maybe save that for Saturday. Um, so. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Uh, let me quickly get out of this and just go back to the first slide so we see the, the links. And I just want to ask really quickly, like, so how many people are going to be here on Saturday? How many people are taking? So, okay, almost all of you. Um, all right, so, um, on, oh, oops. So the, the thing that we'll be doing on Saturday is going to be more or less like a more applied version. There's still like kind of a, a, a large number of us, so it's going to be, um, like I'm going to distribute some software that you guys can use, and I'm going to show you how to how to use some of these like applications that I've been building on um, ML4A. I'll probably bring just a hard drive so we can distribute software. Um, and um, but for those who are interested in getting a head start in it, I would encourage you to visit ml4a.github.io, um, which contains some of the supporting materials that we'll be looking at on Saturday. Um, otherwise, like a lot of this stuff is just scattered about that website in my own.
Um, so so with, with so that's that's about all. So maybe just like if um, if there's any questions in the last few minutes that we have here, um, otherwise we'll 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 call it a session. Any questions? All right, cool. All right, so um, that's all. So I'll see you guys on Saturday. Yeah. Mm -hmm.